uh, we'll uh, present you uh, how the new JPEG XS uh, standard will um, be able uh, to be used in, uh, over the SMT2110 uh, uh, IP uh, standard. Uh, in Tupix, we are uh, a company involved in the broadcast industry creating a, a, a compression technology. So we start uh, with uh, the uh, JPEG 2000 technology. Uh, we are a member of the, the JPEG committee. Uh, we move also uh, with a, a proprietary technology called uh, TICO, which means uh, tiny codec uh, that became a SMTRDD35. And a few uh, years ago, we initiated uh, uh, at the JPEG committee uh, standardization. So we know uh, SMT2110 is taking off, so it is designed to become the infrastructure of uh, choice. So everybody is speaking IP, forget about SDI. Um, but uh, y there is some uh, challenges uh, uh, to that. What, what we expect from uh, the, the IP is uh, reducing complexity, less cables, uh, going bi-directional, becoming more agile, rerouting, easy configuration, less space, smaller, smaller building, smaller hobby, uh, simplified workflow, and also reducing cost. This is a question. I mean, broadcast is going into a cost reduction, we need to uh, uh, compete on uh, content creation, and at infrastructure level, we need to compete with the IT world also. So this is a big challenge. And, but on the other side, we know we have more and more pixel to manage, or more stream, but the roads are jammed already. So can we put more cars on the road without creating traffic jam and delaying the arrival of each passenger at the end? So what about the latency? What about the scalability of the infrastructure? So if we consider HD as a, a basic use case, so HD uncompressed baseband HD 60p42 is about 2.4 gigabits per second. So I can target an IP infrastructure running 10 gigabit Ethernet, and this is pretty fine. 10 gig is affordable. We see easily uh, cables for 10 gig, switch for cuts, IP switch for 10 gig. It's, um, it's also easy at basement level to encode uncompressed HD over your SSD or your infrastructure. You can manage a, an HD pipeline uh, uncompressed in most of the use cases, but it's still really challenging. I mean, the more data you have, the more it's challenging to avoid packet drops, uh, the uh, bit flips when you read or write on an SSD. So, um, and if we move to 4K, and this is the next slide, Wes. Uh, so we need at least a 25 gigabit Ethernet infrastructure, which will cost more. And people will ar argue that, of course, 25 gigabit Ethernet is still the same form factor of a, a regular SFP. You can uh, easily leverage 25 gigabit Ethernet on a FPGA uh, chip, for instance. But it's, again, a little bit more uh, expensive to go to 25 gigabit Ethernet. You need a... Uh, if you do remote production at network level outside the studio, it's, it's even more expensive. It's a big challenge to do 4K uncompressed for remote production. So definitely for, uh, for replay storage, you need some intra-frame compression that does not introduce too much latency to write and read and memory to s optimize your storage. The IP monitoring, at the IP monitoring, you have 4K stream coming, so you need to put in place uh, additional scaling capability uh, to monitor your network. And a code IP switch means at least an, uh, the su supporting 25 gigabit Ethernet. And that's not nothing. Let's look at 8K now. So 8K would need at least 100 gigabit or 400 gigabit Ethernet infrastructure, which are much more expensive at port level, at switch level, at everything at power consumption level also, and at reliability against packet drop also. Um, and the IP monitoring means also new scaling capability. I need to manage an 8K um, a video stream over my uh, monitoring system also. And if I have more 8K stream, how, will, how can I manage that easily? So at, at, the, at the compression level, it's also bring additional challenges. It's more data, so we need more compression um, uh, to manage that efficiently. So, of course, we have what we call cut IP switch available for 100 gig and 400 gig. But are they really affordable or what's, what's the cost? If you look at the long-term 
um, investment, of course, you can expect that uh, you will recover these costs. But more and more, we are moving from capex to opex. So we want to reduce our operating costs also, daily operating costs. So how could you build something scalable? There is a need here to find a technology to help this. And this is the next slide, Wes. Thank you. So what if a technology could help you managing easily more pixel over limit, limited bandwidth and safeguarding the low latency and the pixel perfect quality that you need in your production workflow? So that's really the reason, the dri that was a driver to call for a new standard. And this is the next slide. So a new standard that would help to manage more pixels, saving cost and power, simplifying the SMT ST2110 connectivity while preserving the quality without introducing any latency. So next slide will show you a little bit the, the historical path and where we are today. So we start in 2016 with a, a, call for, uh, a call for proposal, a call for requirement of a new low latency lightweight image coding system. We established from the JPEG committee liaison with the AIMS Alliance, with the SMT, with the VSF and other organization also outside broadcast. In 2017, um, after, uh, the, uh, after receiving six uh, submission, TICO was selected as the baseline and then we started the collaborative effort with all the community at JPEG improving the baseline, finding new ideas in a collaborative way, and um, moving well, the standard from, uh, to voting and publica publication phase. In 2019, and this is here, this is NAB, JPEG XS goes live. You will see, or um, you have seen maybe at the show, first implementation, there was at least two places where you could see that, was from Offer Institute and Intupix uh, booth. Um, and this year will, is really the phase where we will, um, uh, I mean, this is the, the stage where we'll see more and more implementation coming to the market. And so you can expect much more at IBC, I think. So if we move to the next, uh, so where can JPEG XS be implemented? And this is already the, we can go to the next slide. So it's in any application for which you need to preserve the quality, you need a minimal latency, low complexity is very important and efficient bandwidth are crucial. So we speak not only about broadcast here, we speak about a mobile phone in which you need to optimize the internal memory, the communication from the, let's say, the, the processor chip to the display uh, to extend the battery, the life of your battery to move to higher resolution. We speak about some wireless transmission. You know, new wireless technology are bringing to this world higher bandwidth, higher capacity, and lower latency like 5G. This is an area where JPEG XS can be of interest. We speak about auto autonomous vehicles where you put more and more displays and cameras, and power consumption is very important in, the, in this, ar in this uh, kind of application. And of course, we speak about remote production, live production in the broadcast industry. So, can go to the next one. So, JPEG XS coming to SMT ST2110. What does, it what does it mean today? So practically, it's not a huge change. Everything has been built within the SMT ST2110 to accommodate compressed essence. So today, in today's deployed SMT2110, we speak about the part 20. Part 20 is for uncompressed RTP streaming. Part 22 is the part where we will register JPEG XS to transport compressed essence as an alternative to uncompressed. All the other parts do not change. All the discovery, the registration, everything that is done in the full stack as explained on the, on, on the booth here, do, are not affected by this. We are registering the JPEG XS standard uh, RTP payload at the IETF so that it can be directly um, implemented within the 2110 ecosystem. So you can go to the next slide. 
So we are, of course, in an ongoing standardization phase, but almost 99% of the efforts are done today. So the, the part one of JPEG XS defined at the ISO JPEG committee is uh, targeting uh, this quarter for publication. Um, so we have some amendment for additionally IDs. The group is really dynamic and wanna, it's not a standard created for today, but also for the future. So it will evolve over time. But the part two defining the profiles are already uh, well defined and, and is going also to publication at the end of this quarter. The part three defining the transport, the container, the file format, the HDR um, uh, metadata that uh, we will need in HDR workflow is uh, uh, under a last, ba last ballot notes and will be published in quarter three this year. And part four and, and, and part five will follow also after. So in parallel, we have two initiatives that help for the video over IP workflow. One is the RTP payload, as I explained, for SMT 2110-22, which is needed to, uh, to do the encapsulation of JPEG XS stream over RTP. And uh, finally, the, at the SMT level, the, the work on the Dash 22 is uh, pretty finished now. The only thing that, will, that is missing is to just register the JPEG XS as one of the compressed essence within that system. So, so what does it bring? to SMT2110, I think you already understood it, is the transport of compressed essence instead of uncompressed. So you are better in bandwidth to manage multiple stream in HD, in 4K, in 8K. Um, I will speak about a bit the kind of bitrate uh, that you will target with that. You keep all existing advantage of moving to IP, the flexibility, the scalability, and unlimited accessibility with even more. So you have a better impact on operating and infrastructure cost upgrade capability, lower investment to, to move to IP, lighter infrastructure and system, smaller interface. It is the remote production and cloud migration as well. So, so when we say JPEG XS, could it really replace uncompressed? We have to look at all JPEG XS is compared to the landscape of all the codecs that we already know. So, we are, with JPEG XS, combining the best speed, the best complexity, and quality in one codec. So you know distribution codec, like MPEG, the main focus is on a high compression ratio. This has a cost on latency e efficiency, on quality, on complexity, and on all platform interoperability. Intra-frame intra codec has much, are much better in latencies because they, they compress on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So we, we are better in uh, latency. We are providing very good quality because we compress independent frame. We do not have a gap or interdependence between frames. So if you cut during the editing, you don't have any issue with intra-frame codec. So intra-frame codec are really useful and good for production workflows. But in latency, we are not as good because we, we manage at frame level the compression. We bufferize one, two frame for an encoding, one frame for the decoding at least. So in the workflow, it's at least 60 milliseconds of latency that we are introducing. While if we look at JPEG XS here, the focus is that at latency, we don't want to bufferize frames. We want to bufferize lines because we want to be as fast as uncompressed, reaching less than a millisecond. So we are in a microsecond environment, focusing still on the demanding quality that we want in a production workflow. We want to be as uncompressed. And we had ad an additional complexity to that is that we live in an environment where both hardware and software need to run together. And some of the intra-frame codec in the past were not um, uh, built from day one to uh, be highly parallelizable for software and efficient for hardware. This was taken into account in the JPEG committee when we did the call for technology. So, so what do we mean with quality? In the JPEG committee, we decided to use a new quality assessment methodology. This is the ISO 2970-2 methods for near lossless quality assessments. So we did that on both natural and synthetic images. So the way, the way it works is that we are 
uh, one side of, the, of a picture. We decide to use still pictures because the eye is more sensitive to artifacts on still images than on motion um, uh, a video because the, the w basically on video we do not have enough time to catch all the artifacts. So we, that's the rigorous testing we did. One side was uncompressed, the other side was compressed after seven loops of encoding, decoding because in a production workflow, we go through multiple generation. So from the camera to the distribution level, we have different steps where we'll encode and decode the, the, the content. And we need to keep it in a, a lossless quality. So we were on, on this side of the screen, interleaving an, an uncompressed frame with the compressed frame. And this is called a flicker test. So this, if we compress it in a lossy way for the eyes, we will see the, the artifact. So based on these observations, we'll say that on a full transparency to uncompressed down to three bit per pixel, which is approximately, uh, if I take a 444 10 bit content, it's approximately 10 to one compression. The, 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 the people, and we had a lot of uh, independent labs, university participating to that experiment, were not able to distinguish the difference between the uncompressed uh, and the compressed uh, uh, data. If we, if we go a little bit further, we, we do, like you are, we are all used to do, just a, a, a split screen where one side is compressed, the other side is, un is uncompressed, and we do not interleave, we were capable to go in much uh, lower compression ratio uh, because we don't do the flicker test. So, and a, a good thing with the technology also is because this technology is uh, using a wavelet scheme and not a DCT scheme, is that we have a smooth degradation even if we go lossy. What does it mean is that we will never have the blocking artifact that we know with a DCTBS, MPEG, or, 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 or whole JPEG codec, but we lose high frequency. So with the visual distance to the screen, if I am here, maybe I will not see that loss with my eyes. If I come closer, maybe I will see it. So that's, that's what we mean with smooth degradation, uh, the ringing artifact. That's, um, so next, please. So we had a, a test set uh, mixing CGI, natural content, movie content, and desktop content with fine text uh, graphics. So we test a lot of contents, broadcast content, but as well as more computer generated uh, content. Next, please. So we're doing a PSNR analysis on single uh, loop of encoding, but also on multiple loop of encoding, I explain. Next, please. And what we observe is that JPEG XS is really best, meeting the best quality in multiple generation tests. So compared to other technology that, uh, that, that we know, like uh, uh, JPEG or uh, DSC, which is the one that is used in the new HDMI 2.1 standard for 8K, or um, even, a, well, this is a, a VC2, so you see drop of, well, the PSNR increase we have in JPEG XS, plus the fact that we have a, a flat and a robustness after multiple encoding, decoding generation. Next, please. And this all, you have to remember, this is everything we are showing here is with microsecond latency. So it's not a codec like the others. We, we get the best quality, but also with the lowest latency. So this, this example, and this is from a white paper we did with an offer also, uh, was presented at, at SEMTI. This is the result on natural images. We can go to the next slide. So these are the curves. So basically, you will see that uh, a JPEG XS on the green curve is bringing the best uh, PSNR here compared to other technology with the, with the fact that we also are, are have a line-based coding compared to other codecs we know like ProRes, VC2, or, or JPEG 2000. Next, please. We did the test also on desktop content. And uh, here, uh, to, to also observe uh, the, the quality, we can go to the next slide, please. We, we cannot compress as much as natural content. So here we speak more like a, uh, of, uh, 8 to 1, 10 to 1 compression on desktop to be above the, the 40 uh, uh, dB in PSNR. But the behavior of the codec is, is really good for that as well. We can go to the next. So according to the MIT, 
the human perception of latency is when you have a latency that is above 13 milliseconds. So meaning you start to feel the latency if you have more than 13 milliseconds. The fact that JPEG XS has a very low latency, you could cascade multiple devices using this technology in each interface, and you will need to cascade a lot of the device before reaching that 13 millisecond of latency. So this is very good. Also to note, it's a constant bitrate codec. So you get what you ask for. And in a network, it's very important that we never exceed the expected uh, bandwidth and that we fit the pipe as it's expected. So constant bitrate is a must have in a 2110 uh, infrastructure. So we can go to the next one. JPEG XS all platform, what we mean by that? So first, we have a minimal complexity to, for maximum efficiency. We define multiple profiles with, within the JPEG XS standard that can enable you to scale the standard according to your compression need. So if you need four to one, no need to implement all the modes of JPEG XS. As long as we have an interoperability point at every decoder to decode, even if it's a two to one uh, compression, that the decoder can be still universal. And it's, we had that discussion within the JPEG committee to make it very efficient in terms of profile management. But also in software, we did introduce much more uh, level of parallelism within the syntax so that whether you go CPU or GPU, you can also um, um, take uh, all the benefits of this platform to accelerate the algorithm. Um, yeah, next. So also in terms of flexibility, we look at uncompressed, we look at the media production world, and we say, okay, what do we need? We support any resolution, actually, say up to at least 16K by 16K, but it's, it's, it's just, we'd never tried uh, to, to do more, but practically I don't think there is a big trouble to do that. Multiple chroma format, 444, 422, 420, grayscale are supported. Multi-color uh, format, RGB, YUV. Multiple bit depth from eight up to 16 bit at least, and HDR support. Everything is done within the codec to to be uh, HDR. So maximum flexibility. There is this is a nice thing. I mean, it was not the the purpose by default to. It was not in the call for technology, but within the group we've been discussing that could we bring additional flexibility to the user? we have a scalability level. So if I get an 8K code stream, I'm capable to extract a, a HD layer of it or 4K layer of it of a 8K layer of it. I could also, if I need, to access just the part of the code stream itself to access a small part of the HD or 4K or 8K. So in terms of editing production f flexibility, you could imagine take some benefits of this because in most of the case, if you access a lower uh, resolution or partial, you will reduce the CPU or GPU load. And in an FPGA workflow, for instance, hardware, you can avoid to use a specific uh, dedicated scaler uh, within your workflow for that. Next. Yeah. So let's look at uh, the operating bitrate. So practically, HD 4K, 8K can operate in a, you don't need more than a 10 gig pipe to operate HD 4K and 8K. Even you could do more than one channel 8K over the 10 gig pipe. This is typically the operating range that we see from the, the highest operating range would be where you are like in a full transparency. As I explained, you do the flicker test and you get the best quality. The lowest is when you don't know the source and this is the quality you get and you feel that you cannot see any artifact. Basically, if you, if you want to see some uh, example, we are showing 8K on the Intupix boost at 2 gigabits per second. And it's, it's pretty good. And 4K, we show that at 500, 700 megabits on the, on the boost as well. And we have other example of side-by-side uh, -side, uh, uh, content. So what does it mean is that I could even go Cat5 e-cables for 8K. Uh, a Cat5 e cables practically can carry up to 2.5 gigabits. So this is really bringing all the power of 2110 in a cost and bandwidth efficient um, uh, way. Um, so we can move to the next one. So what does it mean is basically everything goes on a 10 gig. For the monitoring, I could take also the benefits of the scalability with it. So 
you, you can extract HD, 4K, 8K from the cloud stream. So you can use a simple 10 gig port, simple uh, 10 gig switch, and, and, and go easily um, uh, over IP with your production workflow. Next one. Thank you. So as a, as a conclusion, SMT, J, uh, well, JPEG XS meets all the SMT ST2110 quality requirement. Constant bitrate, latency, image quality, complexity, all platform from software to hardware. It's enabled to achieve even more from the SMT ST2110 standard, supporting higher pixel rate, more stream, using cheaper cables, cheaper interface, reducing the packet size, bringing more reliability on the network for the transport. So we strongly believe that JPEG XS will be very disruptive uh, for the production workflow in the future to bring cost-effective, bandwidth-efficient, and high-quality uh, IP production workflow um, in this industry. Thank you. So when, when, when is the uh, standard going to be done, done? So it's, it's pretty done, uh, I would say, but 99% uh, is like almost everything has been discussed, but full publication of all parts is end of this year. Okay. So, but, but the last part be being like the reference software, but the, the, main, the most important part between the coding style and the profiles are being, uh, I mean, published end of this quarter. So. End of the quarter, very good. Okay. All right, thank you.